it's Chris. And I'm Wyatt Elliott from Notebook Entertainment. And this is the Horrorland News. So our first story today is actually us. <laughs> you may notice that we are not in our normal uh, set. That is because we've been on location all week shooting a bunch of different Halloween stuff for both our channels. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, it, it's exhausting, but a lot of fun. We're also in the process of, as you saw in last episode, of moving our set and everything and redecorating it. So, um, it's a th- process. It's a process, <laughs> but, you know, thanks to you guys, we're going to keep doing this. So. Yeah, so thanks for watching. And uh, as a treat, we're going to update one of our previous stories. Uh, you may remember we told you that there were two different Hellraiser projects in the works. Yeah. Um, the one for Hulu has finally announced that they cast their pinhead, um, and they've gone with a female, uh, the L Word actress Jamie Clayton. Now, I'm not familiar with her. I don't watch the L Word. No. Um, I looked at her IMDb. She's been in, like, Sense8 and a couple other shows okay. that I've heard of but I'm not mm. familiar with. Um, but I'm sure she'll do a good job. And the main issue here is a lot of people are already complaining that it's, you know, gender swapping the roles. But if you actually knew the source material, the gender swap happened in the original movie because in the book that the movie is based on, the character known in the movies as Pinhead is actually female. So the source material, she's female. So this isn't retconning, this isn't gender swapping, this is actually sticking truer to the source material. Which is probably why they had a female centibite, but she was always just in the background, right. you know, at least in the first couple of movies. Well, in the book, I guess they you move know. as a group, and yeah. then the one that eventually becomes Pinhead in the in the series, the leader or whatever, she's a female okay. in the book. I don't care. I'm down yeah. for whatever. Like, I can picture it either way, and they're demons. They can be whatever they want to be, is Who what cares? I see. Right. So, like, yeah. I think it'll be fun. I'm still looking forward to it. I mean, to it. ID Channel is a whole channel devoted to women killing people, <laughs> so, like, women can kill people oh, just as well. Oh, for so. sure. Of course. <laughs> Shout and, out to ID Channel. I love it. And uh, women know how to inflict that pain, too, whether it's good or bad. <laughs> so. Depends on uh, whether you like the pain, I guess. <laughs> We won't go there. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so um, we'll move on to our next story, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, Netflix teamed up with Keaton Patty. Yeah, Keaton Patty. Uh, And they together forced a bot to watch (laughs) 4,000 hours of horror films and then write its own movie. And they've released it on their Netflix is a joke uh, channel, which is where they release all their comedic uh, yeah, they shorts put clips and stuff of like that. And stuff on there. This is worth watching. <laughs> it's hilarious. If you guys like that, I made a bot watch and then this is what happened sort of things. Mm-hmm. This is hilarious. They've animated it. Um, there's some great lines in there, some great cliches from horror. Yeah, it's really hilarious, and it's free to watch. It's like yep. four minutes long, four yeah, or five less, minutes, something yeah, like that. Yeah, less than five so, minutes. But, um, <laughs> one of my favorite lines is actually a stage direction, and it's um, a puppet with a mask made in hell or Texas <laughs> <laughs> rides a mean unicycle with three wheels. <laughs> a unicycle with three wheels. <laughs> it does inspire I love a visual. It. I love it. It's also an oxymoron. So, yeah, the title is, by the way, the title of this movie that the bot wrote is Mr. Puzzles Wants You to Be Less Alive. (laughs) Mr. Puzzles. I sold already. (laughs) I like that. That's a good name for a killer, Mr. Puzzles. Mr. Puzzles. I like that. But, you know, the next time, they should just hire you because you've watched 4,000 hours of horror movies. I mean, clearly. clearly. (laughs) But, yeah, I'm not not feeling... I've watched this. It's entertaining. I don't think any horror writers should feel like their jobs are in jeopardy. (laughs) But next time, Netflix, can we go the whole mile and film an entire two-hour movie like this? Oh, my goodness. I don't even think I could handle two hours. (laughs) Uh, It's great, though. Definitely check it out. Yeah, Two hours and live action next time. (laughs) Yeah, it's all computer-generated imagery, so it's not the greatest-looking thing, but it is fantastically funny. <laughs> <laughs> Probably makes it better. Um, so, our next story is a super cool project that's going to be premiering in the U.S. at Screamfest LA on October 15th, followed by VOD distribution on November 2nd. And it's called Isolation. It's an indie film. 
Um, and it's by Nathan Crocker or Crooker. This already premiered at uh, Fright Fest in the UK earlier this year, and it was so um, gripping and you know did so well that it already has uh, two production companies snatched it up. Oh, wow! Um, so it's already been snatched up by Gravitas Ventures and Kamikaze Dogfight Productions. Um, so what is an uh, what is Isolation? It's an anthology film um, made by 11 different filmmakers that connects the stories of nine people all around the world during the pandemic. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was created during the pandemic lockdowns of 2020, and the filmmakers could only use whatever equipment they had with them when they went into lockdown. Huh. So, okay. <laughs> if you left something at the office, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were barred from using Zoom or other video conferencing apps so that that feeling of isolation would, you know, come through. Okay. Um, and then the nine, it's basically about this nine stories of different people confronting their darkest fears during the pandemic. That was like all of us. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think we're all going to kind of relate to this one a little bit. It probably even ups the scares because you're going to have to rely on things that all you can relate oh, yeah. to and are in our heads and the way so. that I'm relating this is, um, I don't know how many of you out there are SNL fans, Saturday Night Live, but when they had to do their shows from home for mm -hmm. a year, that's what I'm thinking of, is where they had to, it, it pushed them to figure out, okay, how can we still yeah, do was, these comedy skits? And it was fascinating to it watch. It was, it really because, was. Especially as independent filmmakers where we know, <laughs> you know, like, if we're not at home or something or wherever our equipment is and we have to film something, I mean, obviously now you got phones, you have different kinds of cameras, you have... Lots of options, but still to limit yourself that way and not yep. have the perfect scenario. Like sometimes I feel like that's every day for us. But. Right, <laughs> we're getting <laughs> there. When you limit budget, actors, props, makeup, all that stuff, it really does, and it forces you to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I'm excited. I wish I was a part of that. That would have been fun. So isolation. Um, again, it is premiering at the Screamfest LA on October fifteenth. If you're able to go to that by any chance, otherwise it'll be VOD streaming uh, November second. I don't okay. know. It didn't say which streaming service, so we'll keep you updated on that. And we'll probably actually feature this in our indie film spotlight once we yeah. do watch it. Let's do that. We just made it. We just made a decision. <laughs> decision made. <laughs> decision and done. done. And our next segment is going to be real quick, but I just wanted to talk about this. They dropped a new trailer for the new Resident Evil reboot. Oh, yeah. I, for one, was not a fan of the Mila Jovovich films. They were fine, but they didn't follow the old game at all. And all of you gamers all know this, whether you love the movies or not. So with this one, it looks like, I mean, they've even got, I'm going to show side by side here. They've got scenes from the game and the movie that all are the same. They are they're they're in a mansion. They're I mean it's a little bit of Resident Evil 2 it looks like there. They've got the characters from the game in it. Um the the the, the monsters even look like they were in the game. For I am excited for this. It does look like it's a little not finished. Um <laughs> but it was that happens in trailers. It does. Um it was premiered at the New York Comic Con. As I long as if they're gonna make it like the video game, fine, whatever. As long as it's not like the freaking empty man where we're <laughs> okay, walking for ten fair. minutes discovering nothing, <laughs> nothing jumps out of no I I can't that I, movie's ruined me. I don't <laughs> I think they will really. because this is still produced by Screen Gems okay. and it still has that same kind of like so and they move they make fast paced movies okay. generally. Like I'm cool with comic game movies, but <laughs> we don't need to follow the character through their entire yeah. existence. Anyways, I just wanted you guys to check it out. Let us know in the comments what you think. Are you excited for it? It comes out November twenty fourth. So it's right around the corner. You better get on those uh, special effects then. <laughs> right. That's why I'm nervous because the effects do look like they're not finished. They look like they're from an old PlayStation game. Well, fans honestly. got Sonic pushed back because how bad that yeah. looked. So, I mean, enough people raise a stink, they might push it back and work on it a little more. Yeah. and all, but, but maybe it's good. Maybe it's great. So, anyway. Give so it a shot. <laughs> give it a shot. Ch ch check out the trailer. Link will be in the description below. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll talk about it more as it comes closer to the date, too. Oh, for sure. It, <laughs> 
If it's bad, we're going to we'll do a long you know. video we'll for that you know. one. <laughs> we'll let you know if it's good, too. We're not of course. haters. We'll let you know, good or bad. <laughs> of course. If it's, a good video, if it's a good video, then maybe it'll be short. But if it's bad, I'm going to have some things to say. <laughs> yeah, so our final story is normally our review this segment, which it still will be, minus us. Because we are introducing you guys to one of our new correspondents. His name is Aaron. Mm -hmm. And his film that he's talking about today is a Netflix movie called No One Gets Out Alive. <laughs> which... I was curious about this. I have not seen it yet, so we're going to let Aaron tell us all about it. All right, take it away, Aaron. Here's a review of No One Gets Out Alive. It's a brand new horror movie on Netflix. I didn't have much hopes for this movie. I thought it would be okay at best, and that would be about it. It actually took me by surprise. It's a genuine horror movie. It doesn't rely on jump scares. It's not about just some monster. It stays focused not entirely because there are other people involved but focus on one main protagonist ambar and what happens around your life and there's a lot going on that kind of pulls you in in a really unique way no forced exposition you will have to pay attention <sighs> thank you it's very tiresome to see movies where they tell you, oh, I am sad about my mom. I sure do miss my mom. No, this one, it does it in a realistic manner. Because at first, you don't know what's going on. And then you realize, mom may not be around. Or is she? There's a lot going on. There's a lot of surrealism. There's plenty of mind play going on there where you don't know what the person what Ambar is seeing is real and what's just a dream what is who knows what is what and one thing that's very cool is the way they play with lights in this one specific way a lot of times if it's something evil and you're supposed to get that creepy chill up the spine factor Everyone's got a light in their eyes. And I don't mean a light coming out of the light out of their eyes. It's light being reflected off their eyes. You won't you'll see a silhouette, you'll see minor details of the person, so you can kind of make out like what they are. But the one thing that you cannot break is that that gaze. They just stare and there's a light reflecting on their eyes, and it's so creepy. But it's also it's not a scariness to it. Because maybe not everyone is bad. So the story, it revolves around Ambar, but that's not the main true focus. Because this is just about an undocumented person trying to do something with their life. You're not too sure. All you know is she's trying to get a lot of money. Why? You'll find out later on. And it's not integral to the plot, but it ties it into the character, which is actually pretty good. Uh, the entire cast is very well done. I was surprised. No one really made me go, oh, that's someone I should know. Everyone seemed new, but they all played their roles perfectly. I mean, even minor characters that probably only had a handful of lines, they did a really good job. I was genuinely surprised. Even people that just kind of leave, like they just, they're, they're gone. They actually do a very good job. There's a very wide kind of cast, mostly female driven, which is amazing. And the protagonist, she is really good. Not only the actress who plays Ambar, but just Ambar in general. Because she's strong and she's <laughs> resilient <laughs> when you see what she goes through later. The one thing you're going to see a lot of in the movie that I believe they even showcase in the trailer is a stone box. What's inside the stone box, you won't know until pretty much near the end of the movie. And even then, it takes you by surprise because there is something inside the box. What it is, we're not really told very clearly, which is good. It adds to the mystery. It, it, it makes it so, again, no forced exposition. You know what the characters know, and pretty much only what Ambar knows. If she doesn't know about it, you won't either, which is good. 
it stays focused that way. It doesn't just start throwing ideas out willy-nilly. Now, technically speaking, this movie is phenomenal. The sound design, because how things are played out in certain ways, they use sound design in an amazing way. They don't rely on loud noises and stuff like that to make you, you know, get a cheap little jump scare out of people. It's more about actually tying in things that you don't think about that a lot of people take for granted, how sounds will be softer from a distance, but can sound thunderous when they're up close to you. Especially with how certain things are. I'll get into spoilers later. Another thing they do really well is they pull people into the camera. I got kind of a Quentin Tarantino vibe where the camera can be tight on a person's face, but it forces the actor or actress to actually have all that attention on them and showcase their emotions, their thoughts, their feelings, their everything right then and there. There's nothing to rely on. Sometimes they don't say anything. It's purely from their body language. And to go along with that, the lighting too, which is very weird. But there's a couple moments where the lighting really plays with how creepy things can be. And actually shows like it can disorient you as the audience. And that's something that's done quite a bit. And it adds into the whole thing with the stone box. Because there are times where the box is open. It doesn't open from the top, though. It opens from the side. And you don't see anything inside there. And that's very creepy because it's pitch black darkness inside. But it's not the only thing inside that box. With the story, the horror genuinely grows. It doesn't just start at a 9 and then bounce up and down. This is a rare kind of movie where it starts down low. It starts off very easily. It gets a big spike, and then it kind of, just to kind of unsettle you, to give you an idea of what to expect. Very early on, because there's not going to be spoilers, you're going to see a lot in the trailers. One, there are people? We'll talk about them later. Again, with the eyes that have a glow coming off them, not from it within. It's more or less about it's so dark and there's very low light, you don't genuinely see them that well. That or maybe they don't want to be seen themselves. Maybe they can't be seen. Again, what Ambar doesn't know, we don't know. Uh, talk about the horrors. Okay. Uh, whenever I'm reviewing a movie or even a game or a book, anything like that, the first time through... I won't take notes. I'll just stay focused in the moment. This time it was hard for the second time for me to take notes when I was watching the movie. I was genuinely just want to sit down and watch it again. It's very enjoyable. It's just a well done movie across the board. The cast, the lighting, the sound design, the camera work, the writing, everything. It's a great movie. And again, I had no hopes for this and it just knocked me down it kept going even special effects cgi pretty good could use a little bit of tweaking but what things like cgi don't but that doesn't say they don't have creativity it's a great movie i cannot stress enough how good it is it is phenomenal just mm. but coming up are the spoilers All right, we're focusing on Ambar. She is an undocumented, I don't want to say citizen. She's an illegal alien, to keep it short. And she's wanting an ID. And that's the reason why she needs a lot of money. Uh, she specifically wants an ID from Texas. The reason why from Texas is her mom lied to her brother, Ambar's uncle, uh, that she was a native of Texas was a lot and ambar's got a co-worker at this place that says well i've got a guy who can get you an id saying you're from oklahoma she says that won't work he's like well texas is gonna be like three thousand dollars not a thousand so she works around it and tries to work with the person that she's now living with it's like a, a women's only I guess apartment complex, it's obviously kind of a little bit fishy because they do take cash 
uh, deposits and things like that. They do request that you provide their ID. That's one reason why we see Ambar moving into this new building. Her last play said, I can't have you stay any longer. You need to provide an ID if you want to stay here anymore. And she doesn't have an ID, so off she goes. Uh, here's where things get kind of kooky. Ambar starts hearing and seeing things. Like we start seeing that people are ghosts. We know that they're ghosts later on because there's a moment there's a scared girl, again, with the silhouettes, barely able to define details from her, but you get the idea, idea of like what she was wearing, you know, the long hair. You can hear her voice and how she's kind of like sobbing at first and scared. And here's where it gets very creepy, and again, with the sound design. There's a moment where the girl runs at Ambar, but you don't see her run. She's standing, and then she's gone. And all of a sudden, there are footprints on the ground racing right at Ambar, and you can hear the... No, I probably shouldn't. Sorry about that one. You can hear the soft taps be, get louder as they, as they go through Ambar. It's almost like it's a memory being played out because all of a sudden, Ambar sees someone else in where the girl was, where the scared girl was. This lady comes charging through, and I'm probably messing that up a little bit, but the whole thing is it turns out to be a fight between these two women. I don't want to get into why, because again, it really pulls you into Ambar not knowing you don't know. It stays focused on her, and like her adventure is a horrible word for it, but that's what it plays out. The big thing, the two brothers, Red and Becker, run this building. And the one thing is, Becker seems very odd immediately. He doesn't say a lot. You don't really run into him that much. But there's a couple of times where he's chanting this weird thing and he's leaving like these handprints with this dust. What the dust is, we don't really know. Again, if Amber doesn't know, we don't know. It gets to a point where... Hmm, Ambar gets the shit in the stick. And Red won't allow her to leave. Ambar demands for her deposit back because she needs the money. Because a co-worker who is going to get her an ID for Texas takes her money and runs with it. She quits her job because all of a sudden her, uh, her co-worker just literally dropped a thousand dollars in her lap and then bamoosed. So... Uh, that obviously affects Ambar and it makes it a reason why something is going on at the house because the moment Ambar tries to leave, Red makes it so like I it's like, why do you want to leave? You know, like you really want me to they meet up at a diner. Red meets up at their she says, I need my money and he's like, Yeah, it's back at the place. Like, well can you go get it? You really want me to drive all the way back and then here just to bring you money. She's like, I can't go back to that place. He goes, why? You know, he doesn't make it a big thing that she's scared. He's making it more like he's inquisitive. It's still pretty believable. But instead, he's like, here, just I'll drive you back. Your money's in your room. You just pick it up and go. Sure enough, Ambar's in a hurry to leave. There's a couple other girls kind of want to party around. And sure enough, Red provides him with alcohol. Totally not a weird move. So, Ambar's hunting around for her money. She can't find it. Gets almost in Red's face. Where's my money? Red goes, have a drink. She goes, no. You really should. It'd make this a lot easier. Uh-oh. Huge red flag. Sure enough, we find out something of a supernatural event is taking place because Becker is ill. What? We don't know. Could be cancer. Could be some odd disease. We just know he's got a bad cough. That's about it. And Red keeps on saying, you don't see what ha the benefits afterwards. So Red is a willing participant. He says he's there to help his brother. Just as his brother helped him when he was younger, now he's going to help his brother get better and 
that's true because you start to see physical changes in Becker whenever someone gets sacrificed. How do they get sacrificed? The stone box comes into play. Now, this is weird because actually they talk about it as an addiction. Because Red even says, to quote his brother Becker, Becker says he just needs a few more hits, then he's done. Verbatim, hits. They're treating supernatural power, like strength and durability and regeneration, because we see, uh, not Red, Becker take a wound and he regenerates it. They treat that as an addiction. They kind of are. Think about it. If you can regenerate any wound, be stronger than a normal person, it's going to be addictive. I don't care who you are. That's going to be like, ooh, I can do more. Especially if you're a sick individual. It even happens to Ambar almost the very end. So, one of the girls is sacrificed. We know because all of a sudden a headless body comes back. Ambar's next. And all they do is they strap Ambar down to a stone slab. And this is great, just dark ritual room. Candles everywhere. It's stone and concrete. Creepy orange glow from all the flames. And there's that stone box. And this box is handheld. It does not look very big. And then all of a sudden, weird things start happening. See, the stone box has supernatural powers for the victims. It put, it from what I can surmise, it puts your mind in a state where you're with a loved one that you don't want to let go. It's like what you truly want. Even one of the girls says, I had a dream where I was back home and I was with my son. But he was different, and I didn't want to let him go. And it seems kind of weird for her to say it like that. It's like, hey, he was different, but I didn't want to let him go. And Ambar has a lot of dreams involving her mom. And her mom's, like, brushing her hair. They're in a hospital bed. Not Ambar, though. Ambar's visiting her mom. And she's just laying her head on her mom's lap as a comforting thing. And it's the same thing. She doesn't want to leave. And... Ambar does break out of the hold, and we see what's inside the box. It is some sort of caterpillar golem monstrosity. It is hideous. It is weird. It ties in with a lot of the moths and butterflies you see throughout. Very creepy. What happens? Ambar fights back. Gets hurt in the process, but kills Becker and then uses Red as a sacrifice. I think one of the other girls, I can't remember if she gets away or if she gets killed somehow. Because there are three girls, one including Ambar. Now, here's the thing. Ambar is hurt, hurt horribly. Becker ended up breaking her ankle or her foot. Somewhere, somewhere around there. And as Ambar's trying to leave, all of a sudden crack. That she can feel the strength you can see it like coursing through her veins almost like it's just like her veins are just growing and her foot ankle whatever is healed instantly no pain it's like an addiction it's a great movie i don't want to spoil how everything plays out i it's mm. <sighs> go watch no one gets out alive but maybe someone does. All right. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you guys for watching. And we'll have another episode for you Monday with our Indie Film Spotlight segment. Yep. And thank you guys for letting us do this because we love horror. Yep. Have a good night. Good night. Bye.